movie, and it was about a, an Italian uh, gangster movie, and it was called the the Valachi Papers. Remember that the the Valachi Papers, and well, you wouldn't know because you're from France. It's where over over in France they speak France, so. But uh, but anyway, the Valachi Papers were there, and it was about this gang family and and so forth. And I think it starred uh, Charles Bronson was the movie star in that. And that thing there. So I was thinking about the Malachi, or we could call it the Malachi Papers. But that's probably not. Actually, we, we're not completely sure exactly how you pronounce Malachi, but we're pretty close to how it probably ought to be pronounced. So that's the funny for the evening, and then we have to get into the lesson. And last, a couple weeks ago, I told a, told a, 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 a joke, and, and so... Uh, Noel came up to him, and he had to tell me his, his, and this is a one that you'd hear if you were laying bricks somewhere. But this, this, this woman came down out of the mountains. She'd been up prospecting, and she, she looked terrible. I mean, she was dusty and dirty, and her clothes were ragged and torn. She'd been prospecting, so she looked pretty rough. And she, so she came into town. She had a mule with her, you know, with all of her, all of her mining stuff on it and so forth. And she pulled up, and she, she found herself in front of a saloon, and this drunk cowboy came out of the saloon. He sees, them, sees her, and he goes, he goes, man, you're an ugly woman, and, and you're filthy dirty, and so forth. He asked her, he goes, you know how to dance? And she just kind of looked at him, and he goes, well, you're going to learn. So he pulled out his six-shooter and started shooting at her feet. And she's dancing, you know. And, and he's shooting at her, and then he runs out of bullets. So he, he puts his gun away. By that time, he's drawn a crowd, and they're all laughing at this woman. And he turns around and goes to walk back into the saloon, the woman, in the meantime, had turned around. She walked to the back of her, her mule and pulled out a double barrel shotgun. And she walks up, and she goes, hey, cowboy. He turns around, and he says when he turns around, all he can see is these big double barrel looking at him. She goes, I have a question for you. Have you ever kissed a mule? And he said, no, but I've always wanted to. <laughs> so anyway. Has nothing at all to do with Malachi, but <laughs> okay. So we're in the second chapter. We're, or I'm sorry, in the first chapter, and we uh, were at verse six. We started with verses six through fourteen last week, and uh, so let me just let's read down through it, and then we'll get uh, after this prayer here, and then we'll get into the lesson. Okay, our Father in heaven, indeed, you are so good to us and bless our lives in so many incredible ways. Uh, Father, we're not just thinking about the physical blessings of, of having roofs over our head, Father, and clothes on our back and enough food, Father, to keep us uh, comfortable. For those things, Father, we're thankful for our eyesight, for our smell and taste, just so many blessings. The spiritual blessings, Father, are the ones that we need so much, even though we don't see them as clearly as we do our physical, uh, to know that you're constantly faithful to us, Father, and that your holy ha behavior is always constant that your promises are ever true, and that your patience is unending. And for that, Father, we just uh, give you thanks. Thank you so much for your son Jesus that Malachi talks about later on and for the promise that he has brought to this world and to our lives. We just give you praise. We ask that you would be with us this evening as we study. In your son's name, amen. So let's look at Malachi chapter 1, beginning in verse 6. A son honors his father and a servant his master, then if I am a father, where is my honor? And if I am a master, where is my respect? Says the Lord of hosts to you, O priest who despise my name. But you say, how have we despised your name? You are presenting defiled food upon my altar. But you say, how have we defied, defiled you? And that you say the table of the Lord is to, be, is to be despised. But when you present the blind for sacrifice, is it not evil? And when you present the lame and the sick, is it not evil? Why not offer it to your governor? Would he be pleased with you, or would he receive you kindly, says the Lord of hosts? But now will, not, uh, will you not entreat God's favor that he may grace, be gracious to us? With such an offering on your part, will he receive any of you kindly, says the Lord of hosts? Oh, that there were one among you who would shut the gates, that you might not use, uselessly kindle fire on my altar. I am not pleased with you, says the Lord of hosts. Nor will I accept an offering from you. From the rising of the sun, even to the setting, my name will be great among the nations. And in every place, incense is going to be offered to my name, and grain offering that is pure 
For I, my name is, will be great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. But you are profaning it, in that you say, The table of the Lord is defiled, and as for its fruit, its food is for the despised. You also say, Maui, how tiresome it is, and you disdainfully sniff at it, says the Lord of hosts, and you bring what is taken by robbery and what is lame or sick, you bring the offering. Should I receive from your hands, says the Lord? But cursed be the swindler who is a male in his flock and vows it, but sacrifices a blemished animal to the Lord. For I am a great king, says the Lord of hosts, and my name is to be feared among uh, the nations. When you think in, in general about a holiness, and, and that's what we've kind of been calling this class here as a call to holiness, but when you think of holiness, it's, it's a marvelous character when you think about it. And when I say that it's a marvelous character, it's a marvelous character trait in that uh, those who respect God's word and, and those who exert caution when it comes to God's holiness and his holy behavior and how it impacts our lives, uh, when you think of holiness in that way, it's, it's, it's an incredible thing. Because when you look at the scriptures, uh, holiness is not an optional matter for us. Uh, God is holy. Those who are holy are to be holy. As First Peter, the fifth chapter, first chapter, and verse fifteen says, be, "Be holy in all your behavior." So we're expected to live uh, holy lives. But here's the question that I want you to think about, and that is, what does it mean to be holy? Well, okay, what does holiness mean? Okay, and so the word means to be set up, set apart. But how, how, when you think about being set apart? How is God seen as holy? If the word means set apart, and, and, I, and I'm not disagreeing with you, Ken, but if holiness means to be set apart, it probably means to be set apart with an intended purpose or a intended action or so forth. Um, how is God seen as holy? Yeah. You know, I mean, when you think about uh, passages like uh, uh, Isaiah chapter 6 and verse uh, 3, the angels are saying, the seraphims are saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. I mean, they're describing something in incredible. If you go all the way back to Deuteronomy, the, the sixth chapter, and if you look at verse 4 there, then it says, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one God, and you have no other gods before me. So when you talk about God being holy, his demand is, is that he should be set apart as special set apart as one who is and we are intended for and so forth and so god like um uh, clint said is set up apart on a shelf if you are wherever but he's set apart in all the universe above anything and everything else he is uh, unique in that way so so god is holy and so as christians uh, we're to live our lives as those who are set apart Okay, what does that mean? That we're to live our lives as those who are holy or set apart. What's the, John? Okay. Okay. And so John says that we're to be immovable according to the circumstances. And what was that second part you said? Yeah. Yeah. You know, regardless of what circumstances are going on around you, that you're going to stay truthful, you're going to stay on target, you know, stay focused on who you are as a follower of, of God. Clint? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Nolan? Yeah, I think that's Colossians 1 and verse 13. So we, we're not to be children of darkness. We are the children of light. We're to walk in a different kind of way. We are to be set apart from the world around us. We are to think differently than the world around us. We are to speak differently from the world around us. We're to act differently. Uh, we're to be that in, in every way. And so uh, we're to be set apart from the world, and our behavior is a demonstration of that fact or is to demonstrate that fact, that we have someone that's different in our, our lives. So true holiness is, is recognized by God as something that arises from a pure heart. Matthew, the fifth chapter, uh, talks about blessed are the pure in heart. So there is, to me, a marked difference of who we are. In fact, Colossians 1, uh, 3, verses 1 through 15, 
talks about an old man and a new man. And he says that we're to act like the old man. The old, or act like the new man. The old man acts like the world. The new man acts like God's children. Uh, we take on a whole different way of uh, looking at, at things. Uh, R.C. Sproul said this, the holiness of God affects every aspect of our lives. Economics, politics, athletics, romance, everything with which we are involved. Um, when, when the holiness of God enters into our life, it affects the way we do things and who we are and, and what we are. And that's a pretty, you know, that's a pretty strong uh, saying there. I was uh, thinking about, um, I was listening to a talk show host the other day. I was on my way into the office and so forth, and this talk show host was talking about uh, revival. I, I, it wasn't a religious show, just a talk show, but, but he was talking about church revival. And he said something that really struck me. He says, the church does not need revival. The church does not need bigger preachers. What the church needs, he says, is Jesus. And I thought, man, that guy hit that right, right, uh, the nail right on the head. It needs Jesus. It needs Jesus be, to be in our lives, you know. And, and by that, when you talk about Jesus needing Jesus, that means everything about him is, needs to become a part of who we are. In fact, that's one of God's goals in Romans 8, chapter and verse 29, is that we be conformed to the image of his son. Okay, so we are, we are to become more like his son. He's not wanting a bunch of more Jesuses. He's already got one son named Jesus. He's wanting us as his children to take on the image or the characteristics and traits of Jesus in our lives. And when that happens, it will change everything about who we are as people in all those different areas. So we're not, you know, we're not, um, we're not pigeonholing or compartmentalizing our lives where we have our religious life and then we have our work life and then we have our school life and then we have our entertainment life and we have our politic life and we know that our life that's in Jesus is constant and that life affects all those areas in, in the same way. Uh, April, I think I, I saw a couple of hands so I'll just go, let's go with Nathan and then we'll go to you because oh. he had his hand up first. Okay, not in this class but in most classes. <laughs> go ahead. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, so for those of you who are watching on streaming and so forth, what Nathan said was what I already said. So he just said it took it longer to do it, but he said the same thing basically. He agrees with me. <laughs> okay, I can't remember all you said. Sorry. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So okay. So Satan. Said, so so April said that that. In Jesus' life, he was just constant, and that nothing swayed him from it. No matter what Satan hit him with or what temptation came his way, uh, he was constant in who he was and what he was about. I was watching a, uh, I, I was listening once again on the radio some years back, and it's when we used to have, uh, to our shame, I guess maybe to some degree, in Meridian, was we had out on the corner of Black Cat and Franklin, there was a Kit Kat Club, which is a topless bar, that's what it was. Okay, and they had one of these also in Nyssa, and there was at a, in the talk show they were having a discussion about that, those places and so forth. And this one guy called up, and I never forget his word, he goes, he goes, I'm a Christian, but I go to the Kit Kat clubs, and I don't allow my Christianity to get in the way of my private life. That's compartmentalization. That's where he says, I have my religious life, where I go to church, but then I have my private life where I go to the strip bar, you know? And so, I mean, it's obvious how messed up that kind of thinking is. So holiness has to be something that is consistent in our lives. Yes, Jeremy. Yeah. 
<laughs> right, right. Yeah. Yeah, so, so uh, uh, Jeremy said, he, he quoted Hebrews 12 and verse 14, which says, without holiness, no one will see the Lord. And then he was saying, he goes, does he think that that's holiness and that he actually thinks he's really going to see the Lord by doing those kinds of things, which are just ca- completely opposite of what God says about and what Jesus says about our morality and immorality, which oftentimes is linked to uh, sexual, sexual activities and so forth. So anyway, holiness will affect every part of our, our lives. So you would think that, any, uh, that everyone would enjoy the beauty of which holiness brings. However, oftentimes it's just the opposite of that. And so, and so why would that be opposite? In my notes I have down here that, you know, when you think about this kind of, urge, uh, this kind of holiness as a virtue, some do all they can to oppose God's holiness at home, in schools, at work, in recreation. They oppose that. And so why would we oppose that? Why would we oppose holiness in those things there? For instance, I mentioned last week, I talked about when we got in, in our valley here, we got in a big fight, or the, uh, the community got in a big fight over the Ten Commandments in Julia Davis Park. Remember that? They wanted those things out of there. So why was it that they had a problem with the Ten Commandments in their park? What was there about that Ten Commandments there that bothered them so much? It's rules. Whose rules? God's rules. They didn't want, they didn't want God telling them, you know, uh, to not commit adultery. They didn't want God telling them not to lie or not to cheat or not to covet or, or that there is no other God before him. You know, they didn't want that, those things in, in their lives. And so uh, the reason why, is, is, as I have behind me, is because <laughs> holiness that we're talking about is built around the foundation of God's holiness and his standard. And so if you push his standard out, you leave a vacuum. And if you leave a vacuum, then guess, what, guess, get, guess who gets to, to fill up the vacuum? Well, we do. We get to fill up the vacuum. We get to decide what the rules are and the standards of living are. And that makes us feel better about things. Well, I would submit to you that that's kind of what the children of Israel are doing here uh, in Malachi's day, is they have the rules that are before them, but they're tweaking them. So that they can do what they want to do. And so his message is directed at a nation that was guilty of rejecting God's commands and resting upon uh, self-centered goals in their life. That, and that happened from the priests all the way down through the, uh, the people. And because Israel was to be God's holy nation. They were set apart to be a holy nation. They were chosen out of all the other nations to be a light on a hill, to be something uh, God's glory and his holiness being on display and, and they didn't do it, and the result of this is Malachi boldly confronts them in doing so. So the most common manner, uh, there's several common things that I think you'll see here, and one is the most common manner of opposition is seen in this. It's seen in the Israel's guilt of, of hypocrisy. So when you think about hypocrisy, what is hypocrisy? What does it mean to be a hypocrite or hypocrisy? Be fake. Say that again? Yeah, you're speaking out of the corner of your mouth. Two-faced. Say one thing, do another. Dana? Yeah, say one thing, do another. Yeah, disingenuous. Um, a pretense of having a virtuous character, moral or religious beliefs and principles that one does not really possess. You say you have it, but it's not there. So think about what we just read here in the section from verses 6 down through 14, and think about the contents of that, and think about how they were doing one thing, but they were, they were saying one thing, but they were actually doing another. Because, let me ask you, were they not going to temple? Were they not going to the temple? Yeah. Were they not offering sacrifices? Yes. Did they not think they were being religious? Yeah. But what were they doing? Yeah, they were giving God the leftovers. They were saying, they were, they were saying one thing and, and doing another. There was a pretense of religiosity, but it wasn't there. They, you know, they were saying they were God followers and God believers and God worshipers, but their behavior showed something completely different, and, God's, and God is not blind to it. God, God sees it, and he is so serious about it. He says, I wish someone just shut the doors. I wish someone had the, or the gates. I wish someone had the, the courage to shut the gates, because I will not accept your incense. I will not accept your offerings. I mean, you can burn them all you want, and you can sacrifice you want, but I'm not taking any of it. I don't want it. 
because, because he knew where it wasn't coming from a deep devotion uh, and, and a heart that was completely bought in. So Israel was guilty of hypocrisy. And the priest and the people were identified as God's favored nation. They sacrificed, they served in the temple, but they were hypocrites. Uh, in other words, Israel's religion had become routine and had become casual in so many senses of the word. So let me ask you this. What's the, quest, what's the problem with, with casual religion? What's the problem with casual religion? Okay, doing the best you can, but not as well as you should. Maybe. Okay, yeah, and I think that's probably all of us in here would say, I'd like to be more all in. I'd like to be more, do better with my life in terms of holy living and so forth. Okay. Uh, it's lukewarm, lukewarm, and we all know what Revelation 3 says about lukewarmness. John? Okay, he eventually conformed to the new standard. You know, you have a standard that God has erected, but then you start living by another standard, and pretty soon you conform to that standard, and pretty soon you start believing that standard is an okay standard, that it's an acceptable standard, because God's not calling, it on, calling them on it until now. Now he's calling them on them being very casual about how they were coming into the service. Larry? Okay, we miss a blessing. You want to expound on that just a tiny bit? We miss a blessing in that... Yeah, if we're not keeping God's commandments, then why should he bless us for doing so? One of the things to think about God is God makes a covenant with his people, okay? We make a covenant with his, he makes a covenant with him, and we make a covenant back. If we don't keep the covenant, is God bound to his covenant? No. You know, I make a promise to you, but if you don't keep your promise, I don't have to keep my promise. You know, this thing goes two ways. Uh, Bailey. Yeah, he, sir, yeah, yeah. Why would we want to? Why we would we want God to be casual with us? Would we want God to go halfway with us to get fifty percent with us? I'm kind of getting my sermon Sunday morning, but would we want that? And the answer is, was of course not. It's rhetorical, obviously, Dana. Okay, so Kavanaugh thinks it's the lowest, do not, the lowest thing that you can do and still think that you're, you're in. You know, uh, he had a great, uh, he, what he said was, was really good. As you were thinking, I was thinking about uh, what Jesus said. He says, unless, you're, and, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. And, and when you talk about guys who are trying to dot the I's and cross the T's, Pharisees are pretty good at that. And he says, unless your righteousness exceeds that. And, and I think he's talking about heart here now more than so than action. Um, yeah, casual, being casual doesn't go the second mile, absolutely. Uh, it does not require much thought or practice. You can just go in and do your stuff and go out. Go in, do your worship, punch your, punch your ticket, and then walk out and think everything's okay. But God's not like that. God is someone who demands us to put ourselves into things. And so it inevitably leads to hypocrisy. It, it, it inevitably leads to pretense where you think you're doing it, but it's nothing more than just a shadow of what really is expected. So hypocrisy is not a deliberate choice, but rather a subtle process where you just let down on a few things and you let down, you let down, and pretty soon you're gone. You know, um, April? Uh, yeah, casual, it's easy. She looked at the definition of casual. It's easy, it's relaxed part-time yeah so uh, how is uh this hypocrisy seen in the text well we've always the the text says that they're offering up uh they're lame they're offering up they're blind they're offering up they're sick you know uh and they were looking at their own flocks and they're saying we'll give you the best god then they got in their flocks and say wow this 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 lamb here looks really good i could probably get a 
pretty good penny for him at the market. And here's one that's blind that's not going to get so much. Here's one that's kind of sickly or lame. It's still going to be meat. I'll go sell it instead. Or I'll sacrifice it to God instead. And so there, it, it, uh, yeah. And so they performed the motions, but they lacked a sin sincerity. They had all the elements of worship, but there wasn't a sincerity. Their heart wasn't engaged in it. Uh, Steve. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Steve said, so, was, it, was it possible that maybe, and the answer is yes, but th is it possible that because they felt as though God was not giving them everything and keeping his promises and loving them, then that's why they decide not to give as much back. They were responding in kind. And that's exactly what they're saying, because they said, God says, I have loved you. And he said, how have you loved us? And then he says, well, let me give you an example. Malachi says, here's an example of Esau and, and Jacob. Did not God not love Jacob and Esau he hated or, or, or gave preference over to, to Jacob? And what was, what, is, what was Edom like and what was Esau like? And when they came back from captivity, who came back from captivity? When, when the rebuilding took place, who was it that rebuilt and it stayed rebuilt? Or, and who was it that could not? So he, he's the example of Esau and, and, and Jacob as a demonstration of his love. So when they were saying, God has not given us everything, God's answer back to him says, I've given you everything. How much more can I love you? What more do you need? You know, than what, than what I've... It's kind of like when we were praying tonight or when we, someone had mentioned about... Was it me in my prayer? I think it was in my prayer. That, you know, how God gives us so much. I mean, where do you start on all the things that... Counting your blessings. Where do you start? Where do you end? You know, you go hours just from one thing to the next that God has blessed us with, and that's just the physical stuff. And then you can get down to the spiritual stuff. And so, uh, hypocrisy corrupts. Hypocrisy of a few condemns or corrupts the souls of many outside the faith. Think about that. You know, if you call yourself a follower of God and you're a Christian, and then you don't walk that way, who who all does that affect? You know, I mean, it really affects the outside uh, people, you know. Um, during the, during the uh, days of the conquistadors, you know, when they came in from Spain and came in and went among the Indians and so forth, you know, they had their priests that were telling them to live this kind of way and live that kind of w way. But the soldiers who to co claimed to be, quote, Christians, Catholics and so forth, they lied and they cheated and they murdered. And the Indian says, why would we want to live a life like that? That's, a, that's all a facade. We're not going to live a life like that. We choose to we'll worship our own gods the way we have always because we certainly didn't live like that. So, and so hypocrisy corrupts and it hurts other, hurts other people. It corrupts many who are within the fold of salvation. And that's the case that you have here because that's why he goes at the priests so hard because who are the priests supposed to be? They're supposed to be the righteous. They're the keepers of the law. They're the teachers of the law. They are to be the examples of what holy living was to be about, and they were not. And the people were not blind to that. The people could see. In fact, I would submit to you that that's the way it always goes with the fall of a nation or even a fall of a congregation. It starts with leaders and, dri and, and, and drips down to the membership. If the leadership does not have high standards, then why should we expect the membership to have high standards? In the, in the least of things, in the easiest of things. What's the easiest thing for a church, a Christian? What's the easiest thing for a, church, a Christian to do? <laughs> Attend church is the easiest thing you can do as a Christian. And if you can't even get leaders to do that, what does that, what, what does that say to your members? You know, if we can be casual, you can be casual. You know, so, I mean, that's just a simple little bitty thing compared to some of these super serious things that Malachi was talking about. The most common practices of, of this opposition, many think it's impossible that they could be filled with hypocrisy as were the Israelites and oppose God's demand for respect, honor, and holiness. If that's so, then maybe we need to listen to what 1 Corinthians 10, verse 11 and 12 says. In fact, you know that verse of Scripture. He who thinks he stands, let him take heed lest he fall. Okay, so 
And he gives the example, and that follows the example of Israel falling in the, in the wilderness. You know, you know, people who are expected to live right did not. And we'd say, well, that's because they were unfaithful. And, he, and Paul's answer to that says, well, you know, if you think you're standing, you better take heed lest you fall. You better really listen. And so when you look at Malachi, you know, you can say, well, I don't like, I don't like this. This is not us. Okay, well, then listen to it as a warning uh, and make application where needed. Three dramatic failings or flaws of Israel that led to their religious hypocrisy that would be sobering warning for us to take heed lest we become like uh, Israel. Israel failed to show God respect. Look at verse 6. A son honors his father, a servant his master. Then if I am a father, where is my honor? And if I am a master, where is my respect, says the Lord of hosts? So Israel failed to show respect. And God saw it, and he, and he saw it as it started, and it started with, with the priests. So here's the greatest danger of routine religion. It leads to a total loss, total loss of, of respect for God. In fact, it may begin there. I don't have a respect for God, and so I give him my leftovers. I give him what is easy. I give him what is casual, casual, what is relaxing, rather than truly given of ourselves. And so there's always a demand for respect or honor to be given to the one who is greater. If someone is greater, we give honor to that person. You know? For instance, um, without the showing of hands, you know, how many of you like Donald Trump? Okay, how many of you respect the office of the presidency? You see, the, you're talking about an honor. You know, give honor to whom honor is due. You know, pray for your religious leaders. Pray for kings and those who are in authority so that you can live a tranquil and quiet life, you know? And so, you know, honor is given to the one who is greater. There's a respect that is there. That's why when a police officer pulls you over, you should honor that person because he is a servant that's protecting our society, our, our community, you know? And that's why he shouldn't be called a pig and why he shouldn't be called rotten names, you know? And that's why he, should be, he, he or she should be honored. You know, it's just that kind of a thing here. Well, God says, if I am a father, you know, if I'm a master, then where is my respect? Give me my respect. I have certainly deserved it. So where is my respect? So the saddest thing about this was they saw nothing wrong in what they were, were doing. Uh, if you let it look at the bear, but you say, how have we despised your name? Where's my respect? How have we despised your name? These guys don't even know. They don't know what they've done. They didn't see that their service to God was an insult. They saw no evil in it. And yet God says it's, it's all evil. But when you present the blind, verse 8, but when you present the blind for sacrifice, is it not evil? When you present the lame and sick, is it not evil? I mean, we think it being casual, but God says that's evil. You know, and it's only a sacrifice. What's the big deal? It's only, a, it's only a lamb. It's only a goat. It's only a pigeon. It's only a sparrow. It's only an oxen. What's the, what's the big deal? You know, and, well, then, of course, I got, then I started meddling. And I said, eh, well, it's only a song. It's only a prayer. It's only the Lord's Supper. It's only giving. Well, not to God, it's not. It's not an only to him. I mean, it's super serious. Uh, it's super serious to how God uh, looks at things. Uh, George? Well, I'm satisfied with our insides, but the people see our outside. Okay. George says we can walk around being satisfied with our inside, but the people see our outside. And, yeah. And, and, here, and here's the problem with what is behind me, is God sees both. <laughs> he sees both, you know. So do we show God the respect that is due him? How can Christians today show proper respect to God? What's that? Okay, put it in first. Larry? By staying faithful in Bible study, faithful in prayer, faithful in fellowship, faithful in giving. Okay, faithful in Bible study, faithful in prayer, faithful in fellowship, and faithful in our giving. You know, that's one way to do it. Anyone else? Abram says, give him the glory. Prompt obedience to God's will. 
you know, uh, look at First Peter, the first chapter. <clears throat> Therefore, gird your minds for action, keep sober in spirit, fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lusts which were yours in your ignorance, but like the Holy One who has called you, be holy yourselves also in all your behavior. So prompt obedience, constant service to his cause. Uh, Clint mentioned that out of Romans, the 12th chapter and verse 1, where we're called to offer up our bodies as a living and holy sacrifice, which is our spiritual service of worship to God. The worship, word worship there is the Greek word latruo. And um, it's, a, it's where we are offering ourselves up to God. And it's, it's seen as a worship word because it says, let us offer up our bodies as a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God. And so when you're offering a sacrifice up to God, it becomes a worship act. A loving respect for God is important. Uh, Israel failed to show God sincerity when you look at verses 7 through 12. Uh, 1 Corinthians 10, verses 31 states a principle that governs all that we do in religion. Whether then you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. So if God is in the right position, the right position as holy, then whatever we do is going to be giving him, giving him glory. So because the priesthood showed a lack of sincerity, their religion was void of all meaning. And that's where I think I, wrote, I got meddling again, that leaders are to be the examples of holiness and commitment. Uh, that's people are watching us. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And so, of course, the Levite standard was to be God's word and to be applied to their lives. And so if they're living according to that, then they're going to be in good shape. So. Um. They failed to show sincerity. It was a second-rate worship with leftovers for God, as I think Nolan mentioned that word, leftovers for, for God. Their insincerity was due to their thoughtlessness when preparing for worship. Uh, they entered into it casually. They didn't prepare for it. So they came in, did their time, and walked right back out. Their insincerity was a result of shallow devotion, um, Again, when you look at um, when you look at verses uh, eight and eight and nine, um, verse nine. But now will you entreat God's favor that He may be gracious to us with such an offering on your part? Will He receive any of you kindly? Says the Lord of Hosts. It's, it's kind of rhetorical, isn't it? You think He's going to accept that? You think He's going to receive you kindly? You know, and the answer is, is no. So there was a shallow devotion that is there. Um, it was mechanical. Verse 10. Oh, that there were one among you who would shut the gates that you might not uselessly kindle fire on my altar. I'm not pleased with you, says the Lord of hosts, nor will I accept an offering. So they were mechanical. They went in and they lit the fires. They did the slicing of throats, did all that, but it was just mechanical, and it was void of, their, of having their spirit behind it. Uh, verses 11 tell, and 12 says that they were casual in regard to God's, to how they treated God's name. My name shall be called great and holy. I'm a great God. I'm a king above all kings, you know. So uh, they were disregarding or being casual about his, his, his name. So Christians must be aware of this danger. As we assemble to worship, we need to examine our hearts to see that sincerity is always present. So does this bum you guys out any at all? But, okay, it does me, <laughs> you know. But, but I had to stop, you know. I look at that and say, okay, this is real-time, real stuff happening. So it causes me to stop and ask myself, am I preparing myself? Am I ready? When I go... And meet God on Sunday morning. Am I offering my best? When I rise up in the morning and I have my prayers with him, am I offering my day to him? Am I, am I, am I going to concentrate what I'm going to give him on this day here? You know, and you see what I'm saying? And uh, maybe that is even exploded more. To be very honest, I think that worship is nothing more 
Worship, corporate worship is nothing more than an extension of what you've been doing all week long. And if God has not been in your life all week long, I doubt you'll be able to walk in here and flip a, a switch on and say, now God's in my life. You know, and that's what these Israelites were doing. They were, they, God wasn't in their right lives the rest of the week, and so he wasn't at, when it came down to assembling with them. And I just think that we need to really think about that as, as Christians. They failed to show sensitivity. How did the Israelite worshipers look their, at their worship? He said, my, how tiresome it is. My, how tiresome it is. How did they approach the worship to God with contempt? They disdainfully, they scornfully sniff at it. I can't, you, there are so many senses being triggered in an Old Testament worship assembly. Your nose could smell the incense being burned. Your nose could smell the flesh being burned, the hair on the animals being burned. Your ears could hear the lowing of the oxen and the bleeding of the sheep. You would hear the best singers that temple had to offer, the best orchestra that temple had to offer. Maybe not this case, because I think by, when they came back from the captivity, I don't think the orchestra ever came back. But they were, they were bored. And I don't know how anybody could be bored with that. They could, I mean, there were flips being turned everywhere. And so, so what I'm saying to you is worship is not about turning flips in, in a, an assembly. It's not about preachers being entertaining. It's not about that stuff. It's about God. And God being at the center of our lives. And Jesus being at the center of our lives. And when he is, then everything else will be great. By the way, singing last Sunday was absolutely incredible. It was so incredible. Uh, there were a number of times where I quit singing and just listened and thought, wow, this is, this is so good. So, and I think people have their hearts engaged. Uh, I mean, I'm only a man, so I can only go from what I heard, heard but, or heard, but, <laughs> but I heard some really good stuff. Okay, that's it. I think. That's all I've got to say. Thank you for your attention and for all your input as well.